There you go. What's up, guys? Teddy Cornwell here. Welcome to the most underrated podcast in the world, The Underdog Talk. And there's just something about The Underdog today. We have the mind and an absolute beast on The Underdog Talk. But before I get into this man's career, you know I have to give him a proper Underdog Talk introduction. Hailing from Serbia, this gentleman is a retired former IFBB professional bodybuilder and one of the most successful bodybuilding coaches in the world. His most notable achievement was winning the Mr. Universe Bodybuilding Competition in 1989. This man has competed in over 70 different professional body competitions. Good Lord, this gentleman has made the best of the bodybuilders almost quit with his legendary giant set. I am proud and honored to present Milos, the mind, Sarkev. What is up, sir? How are you doing? Hi, Tani. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this uh, underdog talk because I don't think that I can define my uh, whole career as I was always an underdog, right? Coming from uh, Serbia, from a um, country that never really produced any bodybuilders, going on a uh, IBB a stage and platform, you know, I was given a zero chance, you know, so as a matter of fact, uh, I would touch that subject that when I was leaving at the time, Yugoslavia, you know, so Serbia now, uh, nobody gave me a chance in hell that I would uh, step my foot on the uh, Miss Olympia stage, right? This, this is really how it was. Uh, I would kind of be a uh, laughing stock of a nation, like, haha, you're going to go there and compete? with the best in the world, you're going to be in Mr. Olympia and they were dying laughing. As a matter of fact, I'll say this too, uh, my first pro show, I remember, because I, I lived in San Diego and uh, trained in the Gold Gym where uh, IBB pro from uh, San Diego, Jerry Rogers, a USA champion, also competed. So he was uh, in hotel lobby checking in to, uh, uh, you know, compete next day. And when he saw me, he goes, Milos, are you here to watch? I said, no, I'm here to compete. A, a guy collapsed on his knees and started laughing like hysterical, like, like what are you going to do? <laughs> well, needless, needless to say, I beat him. I qualified for Olympia, you know, and, and then I beat him in every other shows. But uh, the the sound of underdog, you know, was uh, always right next to me. And that was that uh, fire that was, you know, fueling me to do better. And I mean, we are going to get that in. And I just got to add before we even get into this interview, Milos came over with just $428.10. But now, Milos, before we get into this actual interview, I, I, I think the nickname The Mind is too nice for you, sir. I think it should be The Nightmare because of all the pain that you cause to these poor bodybuilders. You you should not be The Mind. You are Milos The Nightmare because, I mean, you. I was watching uh, our guy who's kind of uh, coming on, uh, the owner of uh, Jim, uh, Mike, and he posted a video and the look of emotions on Mike's face as you are just going pushing this man I have never seen you are something else sir wow welcome well, underdog can I, sir. can I tell you perfect example here I am going into the gym army gym and yeah. seeing Jack McCarran and uh, he's ready to train I said okay uh, are you ready for me yeah <laughs> so this is what you get uh he survived right he had the best workout in uh, history, and uh, he was unprepared. But I got him to the, to the point that, okay, let's test it. Let's challenge it. Let's go as far as we can go. And, and this is pretty much, uh, uh, look, when you uh, think from a standpoint of underdog, I'm coming to the United States to compete with the uh, best in the world. So what is up to me? First, I can learn everything that is to it that I can apply. And then I can expose myself to the craziest fucking, excuse my language, craziest uh, workouts. And uh, I had to define what would be the craziest, what would be the most challenging, what would be uh, most results producing. So I said, okay, uh, by definition, that would be maximum stimulation of maximum amount of muscle fiber of a targeting muscle group. So how do I achieve that? Do I just go heavy? Do I just go light? Do I go explosive or slow, super slow, 
peak construction, change the tempo, angle, grip, stances, whatever. So I, I realized I have to combine all of them. And, uh, you know, this is really, this is how I'm true to myself. It's not about uh, being different. It's about defining what is truly most stimulating. So when somebody argues with me that the, my style of training is more intense, it could be heavy duty, it could be, I said, listen, so you want to tell me that your heavy duty style of training that said that you just finished the way you did it, if I do exactly what you did and then add a couple of more uh, giant sets to it, the cure would be more productive, that all my giant sets work right after sarcoplasmic, hypertrophy specific, not myofibro that I already did it with your kind of training, would not be additionally beneficial. So uh, I was 100% sold back in the day that uh, this is the way how you truly should train. It's just I'm ridiculed because uh, people think that I only do light weights, only doing giant sets, and <laughs> this is far from true. You first achieve your uh, myofibral hypertrophy specific stimulus from heavy progressive overloads, typical training like everybody does. But then also there's that part that you want to achieve the maximal pump, like yeah. kind of pump, I would tell you, Teddy, if you train, uh, that if today would be the last chance that humanity and later universe and aliens would see your picture of maximally pumped, you can build that Mr. Olympia stage at one time and you want to be blown up like an exploding fool, this is kind of uh, training that I want you to achieve to get that look and then step on the stage or last picture ever taken. So this is how I train with everybody every time. You know, you tell me, it's like, oh, overtraining. Uh, nowadays, they're just like crybabies talking about, you know, less is more and uh, you know, this is overtraining and you're doing it too much. I've been doing this six days a week. Um, twice a day for 15 years, never felt overtrained. And Milos, I think, I think, you know, no, I'm playing, you know what you are doing as you have coached some of the best to ever step on the stage. And because of your coaching, they were able to reach their full potential flex wheeler. Dennis Wolf, shout out, who's coming on next week. I'm really excited to talk with the big bat wolf next week. I mean, Regan Grimes, you truly are a master sculptor. Now I kind of want to take it way back you know, during your childhood, the economy was suffering and times were tough. So your actually father rolled you in karate. And this is the most interesting part I've seen in my time on the underdog talk. However, you quit Milos because it was not an Olympic sport and you could not represent your country. I mean, so you tried judo and trained for eight years, you know, which involves some weightlifting. But during that time, and the story goes, you saw a magazine with the iconic legend seven time Mr. Olympia, the Austrian folk, Arnold Schwarzenegger, and Milos, you were instantly in awe. I mean, Milos, would you mind talking about your childhood a little more and then the emotions of seeing the Austrian oak, Arnold Schwarzenegger going, this is what I want to do? Yes, I mean, of course, uh, I'm from Yugoslavia, born in 1964, so uh, go back in the 60s that you can't even imagine, are you way too young? And especially growing up in socialistic country, uh, with the Communist Party being a leader. Uh, so you're very limited to what you can see, what you can do, right? And uh, uh, I was in a small city. And thankfully, in my small city, there was a soccer team, there was a basketball team, but there was also some martial arts. And my father, being a, a disciplinary, he wanted to get me to the karate because the coach is his friend and he's going to teach me discipline, respect, you know, hard work, which which was great. And, and uh, I liked it. I loved it. And like you said, the only reason why I flipped is because I heard, hold on a second, there's no karate on Olympic Games. And, you know, being a kid, I was a proud Yugoslavian or Serbian now that I wanted to excel in something and represent my country. So this is why I switched to uh, judo because we had actually uh, Olympic medalists in uh, Serbia uh, close by where, where I lived that I actually went to Slavko Badov. Uh, his dojo and, uh, and I trained there. But uh, the shocker was, because up until that moment, not on the television, not in the movies, not anywhere, or in the magazines, have I seen that uh, 
man's physique can look as muscular as Arnold Schwarzenegger and, and the guys from the era, Serge Nabre, uh, Franco Colombo, Frank Zane. I, I mean, I do remember it was like instantly, just like if you and I would now for the first time see a real alien, like, oh my God, this was a shock. And now you want to identify, you know, by the way, I, I would like to be abducted by aliens, if aliens are listening, <laughs> you know. But, but um, listen, the second I've seen that human body can look like that, it was instantly engraved, this is what I'm going to do. So it's just like, how do you get there? So, so let's face it, I mentioned this and some people got um, kind of insulted. Uh, I did it in Muscular Development Magazine. It was um, my, my statement that if any man right now by a miracle stick of the God can be touched and be skinny, undeveloped, fat, <laughs> overweight or muscular, if any of the guys would say anything else but a muscular, they're lying. You know, that's no question about it. Uh, man exemplifies strength and muscularity and aggressiveness and uh, sexuality and all this stuff. So how can you choose to be weak, underdeveloped, out of shape? You would want to be muscular, athletic, and okay, maybe you don't want to look like Arnold Schwarzenegger that I wanted to look like or myself, but you want to have a certain level of muscularity. So instantly, uh, this was engraved to me and I'm trying to achieve that. Unfortunately, or fortunately, my whole family, the academics, uh, my sister is a laparoscopic surgeon and a professor in medical university. My father was doctor of science and neuropsychiatry, you know, so it was uh, basically expected that I finished my studies and I was studying in the uh, Nutrition and Technology University of Novi Sad to become engineer of nutritional technology. Yeah. But along the way, I get this opportunity to um, come to the United States and maybe represent my country, which I always wanted, in the Miss Universe contest because I was invited after placing second in the European Championship in a different federation by a president. He says, like, I would like you to compete, you to compete in uh, Arizona in Miss Universe Contest 89. And I say, like, well, if I get an invitation, maybe I can get a visa and, uh, and travel. And actually, that's exactly what I did. So when I realized there's opportunity to uh, move to U.S. Uh, and compete, I did everything that uh, took me there. So that was my story. And, and I have to add, I mean... When you started out bodybuilding, uh, underdog talk, Milos was not using your regular iron weights or your barbells. Milos, you were using concrete plates that you make. You would make and then place a board on some some bricks to make a makeshift bench. That's exactly. That's exactly. We had nothing. I mean, uh, keep in mind that uh, Yugoslavians or Serbians had a very bad economy, so. You know, pretty much you don't, you can't afford buying a machine, you know, like a bench or something like that. But we could have improvised. So there was just like uh, basically some pole that we would uh, painted and then uh, we would have to make a concrete weight, but you can't really measure it. So let's say we, we made a one that was 20 pounds, but the other one would be like 22. So you have to kind of balance it, you know, to, to, to uh, have it equally. And uh, a bench was just like a piece of wood between two bricks that many times broke. Uh, we didn't have a, a lat machine, so it was just like some pulley that we hanged, you know, with a rope, and it was going all over the place. But listen, uh, necessity is mother of all the inventions. We we created, uh, we, we, we pretty much um, improvised pretty much every machine. Okay, so uh, the training back then was uh, as intense as a, like in Rocky movies, what you see what he was doing on the mountain, on the, on the woods and stuff like that. This is really how we trained. It was just being a tough and doing the work and nobody complained. And I think it's all about how bad you want it. There is no such thing as excuses. If you want to be the best, you will do what it takes. And that is the underdog mentality. It's 
it's something about the underdog. The underdog is truly the hungriest because they're never satisfied. And I mean, I want to look at your bodybuilding career a little more as, you know, your career started in European federations, as you mentioned, as the WBF and the AAU. Um, and during the European championships in Italy, you were given an invitation to participate in the Mr. Universe show. Um, I mean, and then you come over with just $428 and like I mentioned, 10 cents. Would you mind talking about at that transition from back then Yugoslavia to the United States of America, Milos? Well, listen, again, uh, nowadays people can travel and they cannot identify with the situation. Back then, right? I don't speak English. I don't have any money. I don't have any really connections in the United States. You're just going somewhere with the with a dream with a with a plan okay plan is to become a pro bodybuilder right uh, keep in mind uh, i was drug free at the time because the the same magazine the first time i've seen arnold schwarzenegger this iconic picture of his pose with the black and white with the arms looking like the legs mm-hmm. underneath was saying no anabolics and i was of course uh, i always have a uh, that personality that I believe everything I hear because, uh, you know, my parents would always teach me uh, people are good, help them, you know, listen to them, do something for them, make a difference, right? So for me, uh, thinking that somebody might pretend and, and put information that is not true, it was not even considered. So that's how I came to the United States, right, to compete, uh, eating my <laughs> egg whites and and, uh, and rice and stuff like that. But anyway, uh, so I had an opportunity to be in that Miss Universe contest. I played sixth. Wow. And, uh, and I mentioned this in other podcasts that really when guys were asking me what I'm taking, and I didn't speak really English, uh, so I tried to explain essential amino acids, right? But I, I didn't know how to say it. So uh, A-R-R, whatever they were asking me, you know, and uh, uh, I was taking pr- protein and stuff like that the response from the competitor would be a few. And it was just like, uh, put it this way, if you are in whatever country and you don't know any other words, but you know their way of saying a few, uh, it was like, you're a shocker, but you don't know why is this mentioned, right? Did I say something to maybe sound something to insult them? And yeah, bottom line is nobody really believed. Yeah. So then I competed. I came to California. I competed in like three or four smaller shows. It was uh, Iron Man, Iron Maiden. I mean, it's it was even different federation. It was not the NPC at the time. I had no clue about uh, NPC IBB at that time. I came from uh, Yugoslavia that uh, was not explained to me that IBB is leading federation. So here, soon enough, I, I, I just realized the difference in quality. Like, whoa, yeah. these guys from NPC are completely different level. And this IBB, that's it's something. So that's when I turned into that federation and uh, started competing. But I was just outclassed. Yeah. In, uh, in 1988, uh, beginning, I remember I had to make that decision like, wow, if you want to stay here and do what big boys do, yeah. compete at the highest level, you're going to have to do everything they do. So at that time, there was uh, kind of challenging because uh, I always consider from health aspects, everything you can hear about it. Oh, my God, it's dangerous. It's destructive. It can uh, kill you until I realized, oh, hold on a second. It's not uh, destructive. It's constructive. Yeah. Anabolic is constructive metabolism say hold on a second oh and then it's a doping oh what does it mean it makes anybody that takes it bigger stronger faster uh superior okay so why would that be bad right i said oh, well for possible side effects like well any medication you take any whatsoever uh would have a, a the uh, benefits of the uh, medicament that you're using for a purpose you're using and then possible side effects so everything if you are used wrongly and abused would have yeah. uh side effects and be be maybe destructive but yeah. uh to make long story short uh, i don't know how your podcast is about this uh, if if uh, we can speak openly but yeah. i openly speak about uh, using anabolics for 30 something years and never regretting a day in the life that I took them because it made me superior uh, physically and healthier in every aspect. 
and this is uh, just a message for people. Um, educate yourself, learn, and then apply that knowledge. And there is so much power to it if you do it the right way. I totally agree. I think be open about what you do, you know, is such a key thing. Don't necessarily promote it to others, but be open. What you've done is so key. And now the rest is history, Milos. And you actually, you know, said in an interview that other than you that, and Sean Ray, who was actually on the show a week ago, you were the only bodybuilder to have ever qualified for every Olympia in the nine, in the 90s. Um, you chose not to compete in, I think it was the 1995 and 1996 because you felt the same, you know, that the judge favored that, that mass monster, you know, which you didn't really want to compete against. Now, Milos, I have to ask, and this is a big topic in modern day bodybuilding. Do you think the bodybuilding is going towards mass monsters or do you think it's going back to aesthetics? <laughs> I mean, look, look at the winner and then you, you, you're going to know the answer. I mean, it's... it's one glass at uh, who they award to be a champion it's a big rammy yeah. so you understand but but listen i'm gonna say that um i'm a static guy and i'm for shape and balance and all that stuff but uh if you would ask me dexter jackson uh or jay cutler right so i would say like oh i, I love dexter jackson's physique way better i i would like to emulate his physique this is what it is and Dexter Jackson beat uh, Jay Cutler in 2008. But 2009, for example, when they come back, within 30 seconds of that uh, prejudging, I called Jay's number and I congratulated him on victory. You know, before it was ever known. You know, I'm serious. Because even for me, he was so convincingly better bodybuilder uh, with so much more mass, that structure that was just as V tapered, but uh, uh, 10 times bigger. So I understand it's still muscle show. Uh, there's that huge discrepancy that uh, they have a 212 guys crossing over and competing in um, open division. So how do you really judge them? If you really judge them, okay, uh, it doesn't matter your height and weight is just your look, then why do you even make this 212 class? Uh, I think it's pointless. Uh, because back in the day, we had uh, giant killers like Mohammed Makavi, Danny Padilla, uh, small guys beating, you know, those great champions. So, uh, look, uh, I came in, in the era when uh, Dorian Yates was dominating. Aesthetic guys like Sean Ray, Flex Wheeler, Kevin Lebroni. I mean, these three, guys, these three guys in my book should beat Dorian every every year on a merit of shape, mm -hmm. aesthetics. Okay. Dorian was more conditioned, you know, in uh, many instances. Not really all that. Like 94, 96, I don't see him being uh, better conditioned than Sean. And Sean was more aesthetic and, uh, you know, he had a very good chance beating him. But, uh, you know, this, this is just a good discrepancy. Uh, is size alone enough to beat this? But it's the judge's call. So now if judges are calling Dorian, then let's have a nice uh, Jean-Pierre Fuchs uh, monsters like this, you know, going into that direction. If 93 uh, Flex Wheeler, for example, won, I think we would have a different sport. But, you know, so speaking of Flex Wheeler or Sean Ray or Kevin being a great Chris Cormier for me, as well as one of the guys that should have won at the time. But it, it was Dorian's uh, uh, physique that was molded as a champion, right? But then, ooh, here comes Big Ronnie. Here comes Big J. It was this, you have to have that mass for it. And then when they gave it to Phil Heath and Sean Roden, I was under impression, okay, maybe they established that uh, uh, shape is even more important. But I, I'm going to tell you, uh, honestly, honestly, I tried to judge the shows and then I realized, oh, my God, this is like so hard. And then when I see somebody like Big Rami that was standing in the lineup next to William Boniak and Dexter Jackson and just standing there, he was twice as wide. He has a small waist, has that crazy V taper, X frame, so much muscle. How can you deny him the victory? So... Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I'm not saying uh, what is better, what is not, 
I just uh, say that I can see judges going for this because this is like extreme and this is extreme sport. Would I want to see a beauty over the mass? Yes. Yeah. But uh, it, it would be a hard call. I agree. And I mean, we know some of those guys, you know, shout out to our guy, Kevin Lavroni and Sean Ray, who are on the show. Absolutely true gentlemen. And then Doreen Nace just followed me on Instagram first. I have to mention that. And we're, we're in talks, underdog talk. So you might be seeing Dorian Yates sooner than you think, but I so agree. I think it's an interesting turn. And then Ian Harrison, who was on yesterday, uh, one of the best to kind of step on stage, was, you know, talking about how it should be about who's the best on the stage day. And, you know, unfortunately, I think politics and what your social media following has, has kind of diluted the sport a little. I think it's who has the best body on the day of the show. I think that's what it should be. I think that's what this sport has always been about. And unfortunately, I think it's going in, in, in slightly a different way than I want to see it. But I think this year's competitors in the 2022 are going to be, I mean, we're, we're in for a treat. And I know you're coaching one of them, Regan Grimes. Awesome, awesome, awesome bodybuilder. True class uh, gentleman. I mean, I don't know if you're allowed to even answer this, Milos, but who, who do you see being the big, the names to beat in this this uh well, let, let me jump on uh, on uh, what you were saying that uh, you know maybe politics and all. So I, I'm gonna say this clearly without brown nosing anybody. I really stand behind IBB judging because mm -hmm. I think they're doing a phenomenal job. And the reason why I'm telling you is because I sit myself in that seat. I watch the guys, and it was the same three guys doing the same front double biceps pose. And three times I look at them. Three times I I, I change my mind. Mm -hmm. Okay. So <clears throat> these guys are doing this for a living for a thousand times, like Steve Weinberger. I can guarantee you, you give him uh, 13 microseconds to glance at somebody, he would know already he's in shape, he's, you know, these kind of things. It's just uh, two, okay, overall package. Uh, I was very loud to say I, I, I wish we have a symmetry round to exemplify the shape so shape the guys can gain a little momentum and look for aesthetics. Then you have a muscularity round that these guys can prove their muscularity. Then you have a presentation round that you can show poses other than mandatory and exemplify your strengths. So maybe you can catch something that you didn't have in the mandatories and judges can lead there. This is how it is, right? But as I'm hearing and I understand, they uh, always consider all that at once. You know, so the judges are looking all these three components together, you know, and uh, uh, I mean, I'm just the old fashioned boy that uh, like to watch the, the traditional things. Yeah. So uh, uh, I would tell you this, there is no politics, you know, I, I can guarantee you this. They don't have a favoritism. We, will, we would all like to say, yeah, because this guy is more popular. This is, no, 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 no. I've seen how the, the judge, the judge what they see on a day. You know, contrary to other federation that, uh, you know, they, that uh, I mentioned before they had a problem with, they had the score sheets month before the show, which I, I reported back in the day, uh, the, the elite IBB pro, uh, elite IBB, you know, because uh, I was suspended back in the day for telling them that uh, what happened, my Malaysian athletes came to my gym one month before with a list of every uh, medal in every category and oh by accident this is exactly what happened and uh, later we found out there was a price on on each like seventy five thousand for gold 50 for silver and twenty five thousand for for bronze right this is how that federation operates this is never the case and i i, I can guarantee you this because they're just letting the best man win so now what is the best man uh, when you say will it be the uh, big Grammy kind of size, or is going to be the chiseled down more aesthetic? So you mentioned uh, my athlete Regan Grimes, who I obviously love. He's like a son to me, and uh, uh, I'm a huge fan of his physique. And I think he is the most aesthetic guy in uh, in uh, uh, IBB today. But he didn't present enough size to be compared to the you know uh, top guys. So until he gets that right. It's going to always be, oh, yeah, my favorite physique. I love the way you look and all that stuff. But uh, would judges see him competitive? Uh, my other athlete that you know that just two days ago posted a picture, Samson Dauda, 
is 148 kilos, okay, which is, uh, what was it, uh, um, 325 or something, and aesthetic, right? Yes. So he has a chance to to uh, move up into the top echelon. And, and look, uh, obviously top five from last year are the biggest favorites, uh, being uh, Big Ramy, Brandon, former champion, Hadi Chupan, supposed to be champion probably twice in my book, uh, Hunter Labrada fourth and uh, Nick Walker fifth, with William Boniak, uh, you know, being so good this year. I mean, these are your top runners that now we are trying to get other guys integrated into this first call out, if it will be possible. So, so far there's about 25 guys qualified and I expect this to be by far the, the best Mr. Olympia in years. And I have a feeling that many guys are gonna deliver incredible packages and this is gonna be like absolute war. I think it is going to be a war. And Sean Ray was telling us that this is going to be at the best venue that has ever happened. Um, I mean, I'm excited to see it. It's going to be a big one. It's going to be a fun one. And it, it might be one of the top, uh, you know, Mr. Olympia's to ever happen. Now, Milos, I know you are a busy guy, but I have a very, you know, deep question for you. You, you really? see all in the industry. You've really come from you know nothing to something and you've seen a lot in the fitness industry so what is your biggest tip for someone who is looking to start their fitness journey just like you once were sir you know put it this way first set your goals high i mean uh i told you in the beginning of the uh podcast i was discouraged with just about anyone in in uh, yugoslavia like oh what are you gonna do compete with the Americans, you're going to compete with the best in the world. Uh, let me think. Uh, are Americans physically superior to Serbians and um, inferior in any shape or form? Or maybe they have a different mindset, they are, you know, uh, above and beyond. So I have done what I intended to do. And I know many athletes in many sports, many great champions that just basically set the goal, who fails to plan, plans to fail, right? You know, set the goal, educate yourself with everything. So doing the thing or doing the thing right or doing the right thing maximally is completely different. So if you're talking about fitness uh, and uh, bodybuilding in, in general, I'm not gonna touch the other sports, then you know very well, training. Training has to be the most stimulating. Okay, nutrition. Nutrition has to be most uh, 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 precise, impeccable, nutrient dense, timed, give body what body needs at all times to perform at the highest level, okay? It's not just if it fits your macros, it's what kind of macros we're talking about. If it's carbs, what kind of carbs and when? There's a distinctive difference. So if you just look at physiolog physiology, physiology of the body, there are different moments throughout the day. So you should feed your body according to those moments, meal by meal. I, I don't know if you've seen my, my principles, everybody that I train, they know I have their maintenance phases, anabolic phases of the day and fat burning phases of the day. So if you need to lose body fat at the time, you do fat burning phase. If you are lean, like I was lean throughout my career, I didn't even have to do the fat burning phase because I had no fat. But uh, the anabolic phase, right, use it wisely you know, feed the muscle when needed the most, and you're going to start building the tissue. Now, when you realize that uh, we all humans, and even though Flex Wheeler had a genetic uh, mastatin gene inhibitor <laughs> uh, benefits over us, uh, we are all the same. Whatever I did and I do, so can you and maybe better. So set your uh, goals high. Don't be afraid to fail. When you fail, you know, do it again, fail better. You know, this is the uh, one thing that I, I uh, want to command my father back in the day. He was basically, uh, since I was a kid, explained to me to celebrate my mistakes. I mean, really, if I would make a mistake, oh, that was a mistake, and then I would celebrate. I mean, I was a kid, not even realizing, oh yeah, because I learned something, so I'm not going to do this again. 
a lot of people here are just terrified. Oh, I don't want to fail. I don't want to fail. They all fail every single day and just fail better. And then, uh, you know, until you don't fail anymore. And then you're going to be at the top of your game. So set the goals high and uh, uh, work. I mean, I, I love rocks, attitude, hottest worker in the room. We all like to call ourselves a hottest worker in the room. You mentioned uh, something about my nickname, not to be a mind, but to be a, a nightmare or something. Yeah. You know, uh, you know, and I, I took this very positively because my workouts are nightmares. Yes. Let me tell you, your workouts should be nightmares. If you're going there for a picnic and, and a comedy show, you know, you should, uh, you should stay home and uh, watch TV, right? You are there to fight. I call my gym Colosseum Gym mm -hmm. uh, appropriately. Because once you step the foot on the gym floor, there is nothing but a fight. You fight for nothing, you get nothing. You fight for greatness, you get the great. I mean, Milos, you just got me ready to run through a wall with that. I mean, wow. We are talking with one of the best to ever do it. And now, Milos, I actually have to do one final question. Our guys at Subtalk Radio, shout out to them. They asked, what was the best bodybuilder to never win the Mr. O? To never win, Mr. Oh, well, for sure, Flex Wheeler. I mean, uh, you know, uh, he doesn't have an Olympia title, so for sure he is, uh, in many people's eyes, uh, the uncrowned champion. Uh, for sure, Kevin Lebroni yeah. should be in the conversation. Uh, Sean Ray could be in conversation. Um, Chris Cormier absolutely should be in conversation. Nasser El Sambadi, yes. which could rightfully be 1997 Mr. Olympia. I mean, uh, there, there are many, many uh, pros, but um, yeah. In my book, uh, greatest to ever do it is uh, Flex Wheeler. That uh, um, ask anyone, I'm sure if you ask uh, Sean or uh, Kevin, if you have a Chris Cormier on a uh, uh, podcast, any top pro. They're going to tell you Flex Wheeler. And I mean, Flex Wheeler is a, a legend. I'm going to have to go my two guys, Flex and Sean, just because we had them on. Actually, sorry, I said I said Flex. I'm going to have to go my two guys, Kevin and Sean, because we had them on. But Flex truly was a champion. I think he did deserve that win. Milos, it has been an honor and privilege talking with one of the best to ever do it. Now, where can we find your content? Where can we find what you're doing the floor is yours, sir. Anything you want to promote, the floor is yours. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not much of the businessman, obviously, because the uh, <laughs> only thing I can do is uh, my social media, usually Instagram. I don't even uh, watch Facebook. I think it's outdated. I, I think it's probably like, connected, so it goes yeah. directly to the posts that they put on the Instagram. And put it this way, uh, my Instagram is like a magazine or a, my own photo album and, uh, and a fan page. I, I post what I like to see and I would like people to see it. You know, many times people say, oh, man, you are losing your uh, followers because it's overwhelming. I, I'm not doing it for followers. I'm, I'm doing it for those fans that would appreciate. I mean, if I put 19, 90, three, four, five, whatever contest and posting routine of uh, Kevin Lebroni, Sean Ray, Flex Wheeler, you know, how can any true fan possibly not like it? You know, so so this is what I've been doing. So if you want to reach me, right, uh, reach me on uh, at Milo Shachi on Instagram. That's the safest bet. Perfect. And I mean, wow. I was actually watching the video of, of the guy stepping on yesterday because I because now we've had three of those guys in the video that you posted, Kevin, Ian, and Sean. So we got to finish that 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 complete set on that. Guys, please don't forget to check out Milos's content. Follow him. He is one of the best to ever do it. He is truly the mind in the industry right now. Check out Jim Supplements. Truly a top tier supplement that is really the best in the yeah. industry right now. And uh, we are about about to launch my inter workout supplementation. Okay, so talking to uh, Jim Stepani and Vince Andrews, good friend of mine, and Mike, the owner. Uh, I basically uh, completely sold them on most important supplement there is for anybody that trains is inter workout supplementation because this is when magic happened. And I'm going to ask you, Teddy, I don't know if you're doing any 
intra workouts, and if you don't, I would ask you why you, you are not doing it. Uh, here, crash course. Right now, you and I are talking. We have a five liters of blood, right? And ten percent is in the muscle. Very, very uh, little. So if now I saturate your blood prior, prior to the workout and I put all the anabolic nutrients that I want to, okay, and then I take you to the gym and you start training my way with all this crazy stimulation, increase blood flow to the muscle, hyperemia, everything goes into the muscle, and now you, whatever saturated blood you have with all the important nutrients can insert this in exact muscle that you are training. So this is the only opportunity during a day only opportunity that you have that possibility to dump in exact uh, muscle that you want all the anabolic nutrients. How can anybody miss that? So I've been talking for 30 years and some people are listening, but they don't hear me. I say, don't send empty blood to your muscle. You're wasting time. You're training without it. You're catabolizing, breaking it down. You're training with it. You're anabolizing it, you know, building it. So, if your goal is to build the tissue, you're missing the most important part of the day, training window when your various stimulus from various techniques that you use in the, in the uh, exercises that you perform could open up the cell. They would be ready for uptake. Uptake of what? Whatever you put in that uh, drink, they will be in the blood because it's pre-digested, so it doesn't need uh, to go to GI tract, and you're going to be able to nail in every muscle fiber that you're training. So uh, please think about it. It's, if there's a one message, if there is a one message also on the underdog, underdog talk, it's uh, my favorite quotation from Socrates. I can't teach you anything. I can make you think. I just want people to think, what are you uh, losing if you're missing your intra-workout drink? And what are you gaining? So uh, if you want to know more information about this, I did Hyperemia Advantage um, little video on my Instagram page, on my YouTube page. You can see it. And uh, if you want to question me, I would be ready anytime, any place. Well, I know what I'm going to be now taking in my workout, the legendary gym supplements with the mind behind the intro workout, Milos. I mean, Milos, an honor and privilege. Thank you from the bottom of my heart for uh, explaining you know, so much about the industry and seeing a true fellow underdog who truly just laughed at the face of those who laughed at him because now, Milos, look who look who's laughing at them now. You got the last laugh, so well done on that. Uh, from the bottom of my heart, I'm going to say this to underdogs out. 